live from San Jose in the heart of Silicon Valley. It's the Cube covering DataWorks Summit 2018. Brought to you by Hortonworks. Welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of DataWorks here in San Jose, California. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host, James Kobielis. We're joined by Stephanie McReynolds. She is the Vice President of Marketing at Alation. Thanks so much for, for returning to theCUBE, Stephanie. Thank you for having me again. So before the cameras were rolling, we were talking about uh, Kevin Slavin's talk on the main stage this morning, and, and talking about, well, really the background is sort of this, this concern about AI and automation coming to take people's jobs, but really his overarching point was that we really, we, we, shouldn't, we, should, we shouldn't let the algorithms take over and that humans actually are an integral piece of this loop. So riff on that a little bit. Yeah, what I, what I found fascinating about what he presented were actual examples where having a human in the loop of AI decision making um, had a more positive impact than just letting the algorithms decide for you and turning it into kind of a black, a black box. Mm. Um, and the issue is not so much that, um, you know, there's, there's very few cases where the algorithms make the wrong decision. Um, what happens the majority of the time is that the algorithms actually can't be understood by humans. So if you have to roll back They're into opaque, the decision yeah. making or uncover it. I mean, who can grok what a, a convolutional neural network does at a layer by a layer base? <laughs> Nobody can. Right, right. And so his point was, if we want to avoid not just poor outcomes, um, but also make sure that the, the robots don't take over the world, right? <laughs> Which is where every like, media person <laughs> goes first, right? <laughs> um, that you really need a human in the loop of this process um, and a really interesting example he gave was the, um, what happened with the 2015 uh, storm. And he talked about 16 different algorithms that do weather predictions. Mm -hmm. um, and only one algorithm predicted, mispredicted, that there would be a huge weather storm on the, on the East Coast. So if there had been a human in the loop, we wouldn't have you know, caused all this crisis, right? And this the is human the storm that shut seen. down the subway system and, right. and really that's canceled right. New York City for a few days there. That's yeah. right. So I find this pretty meaningful because um, Alation is in the data cataloging space. Um, and we have a lot of opportunity to take technical metadata and automate the collection of technical and, and business metadata and do all this stuff behind the scenes. Yeah, I mean the discovery of it and the leading analysis. Leading the discovery of this and, and leading to actual recommendations to users of data that you could turn into automated analysis or automated recommendations. Well, it's algorithmic, algorithmically augmented human judgment is what it's all about, the way I see it. What do you think? Yeah, but I, I think there's a, there's a deeper insight that he was sharing, is it's not just um, human judgment that is required, but for humans to actually be in the loop of the analysis as it moves from stage to stage, so that we can try to influence or at least understand what's happening with that algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a really interesting point. You know, there's uh, there's a number of data cataloging vendors. You know, some analysts will say there's anywhere from 10 to 30 different vendors uh, in the data cataloging space. Um, and as vendors, we kind of have this debate. Some vendors have more advanced AI and machine learning um, capabilities, and other vendors haven't automated at all. Mm -hmm. And I think that the answer, if you really want humans to adopt analytics and to be comfortable with the decision making of those algorithms, you need to have a human in the loop, in the middle of that process of not only making the decision, but actually managing the data that flows through these, these systems. Well, algorithmic transparency and accountability is an is a increasing requirement. It's a requirement for GDPR compliance, for example. That's right. That I don't see yet, in Wikibon, we don't see a lot of solution providers offering solutions to enable a more of an automated roll-up of the narrative of an algorithmic decision path. But that clearly is a capability as it comes along, and it will. That will absolutely depend on a big data catalog managing the data, the metadata, but also helping to manage the tracking of what models were used to drive what decision and what right. scenario. So that, that plays That's into right. so what elation and others in your space We call the data too. catalog almost as if the data is the only thing that we're <laughs> tracking, but in addition to that, that metadata or the data itself, you also need to track the business semantics, how the business is using or applying that data, and the algorithmic logic. So that might be 
logic that's just being used to transform yeah. that data, or it might be logic to actually make an automated decision like what it's they're talking about It's a data artifact GDPR. catalog. I mean, these are all artifacts that are derived in many ways or supplement or complement the data. That's they're right. All, it, it's all the logic, And like what we, we talk said. about is how do you create transparency into all those artifacts, right? So a, a catalog starts with this inventory that creates a foundation for transparency, mm -hmm. but if you don't make those artifacts accessible to a business person who might not understand what is metadata, what is a transformation script, if you can't make that those artifacts accessible to a to a what I consider a real or normal human being, right? <laughs> I love to geek out, but <laughs> at some point not everyone's going to understand. She's the normal human being in this team. <laughs> okay, I'm the abnormal human being <laughs> among the questioners here. So, you know, yeah. most, most people in the business are, are just getting their arms around how do we trust the output of analytics? How do we understand enough statistics to know what to apply to solve a business problem or not? And then we give them this like hairball of technical artifacts and say, oh, go at it, you know, here's your transparency. <laughs> well, I want to ask about that, that human that we're talking about that, that needs to be in the loop um, at, at every stage. What, that, that surely we can make the data more accessible and, and, and but it also requires a specialized skill set. And I want to ask you about the talent because I noticed on your LinkedIn you said, hey, we're hiring, so let me know. Um, <laughs> That's right, we're always hiring, we're startups. So, we're growing well. So I want to nice. know from you, I mean, are you having difficulty with, the, with filling roles? I mean, it, what is the, the pipeline here? Are people getting the, the skills they need? Yeah, I mean, there's a wide, what I think is the misnomer is it's actually a wide variety of skills and I think we're adding new positions to this pool of skills. Um, so I think what, what we're starting to see is an expectation that, that true business people, if you're in a finance organization, or you're in a marketing organization, or you're in a sales organization, um, you're going to see a higher level of data literacy be expected of that, that business person. And that's, that doesn't mean that they have to go take a Python course and learn how to be a data scientist. It means that they have to understand statistics enough to realize what the output of an algorithm is and how they should be able to apply that. So we have um, some great customers who have formally kicked off internal training programs that are data literacy programs. Mm. Um, Munich Reinsurance is a, a good example. They, they spoke with uh, James uh, a couple of months yeah, ago in this Berlin. this conference in Berlin, That's yeah. right, that's right. And their chief data officer has kicked off a formal data literacy training program for mm. their employees. So that they can get business people comfortable enough and, and trusting the data. And, it's a business culture transformation initiative that's very impressive. Yeah. How serious they are and how comprehensive they are. But I think we're going to see that become much more common. Pfizer has taken, who's another customer of ours, has taken on a similar initiative. Um, and how do they make all of their employees be able to have access to data, but then also know when to apply it to particular decision making use cases. And so, we're seeing this need for business people to, to get a little bit of training, and then for new roles like information stewards or data stewards to come mm -hmm. online, uh, folks who can curate the data and the data assets and help be kind of translators in the organization. Stephanie, would there be a need for a, an algorithm curator or a model curator to, exp you know, like a, a, a model whisperer to explain how these AI convolutional yeah. current, mm -hmm. whatever, all these neural, how, what they actually do? You know, will there be a need for that going forward? In other words, a normal human being who can somehow be bilingual in, in, in neural net and in standard language. I, I, think, I think so. I mean, I think we put this pressure on data scientists to be that person. Oh my gosh, they're so the... busy doing their job. How can <laughs> we expect right. them to explain it? Right. I mean, to right. spend 100 percent of their time explaining it to the rest of us. And this is the, the challenge with some of the regulations like GDPR. We, we aren't set up yet as organizations yeah. to accommodate this complexity of understanding. And I, I think that this part of the market is going to move very quickly. Mm -hmm. So. Um, as, as vendors, one of the things that we can do is continue to help by building out applications that make it easy for information stewardship. How do you lower the barrier for these specialist roles and make it easy for them to do their job by using AI and machine learning where appropriate to help scale the manual work, but keeping a human in the loop to certify that data asset or to add additional explanation 
and then taking their work and using AI and machine learning and automation to propagate that work out throughout the organization so that everyone then has access to those explanations. So you're no longer requiring the data scientist to hold like, I know other organizations that hold office hours and the data scientist like sits at a desk like you did in college <laughs> and people can come in and ask them questions about neural nets. And that's just not going to scale at today's pace right, of business. Right. The, 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 the term that I introduced you know, uh, just now, the, the algorithm or model whisperer, you know, the recommender function that is built into your environment and, and similar data catalog is a key piece of infrastructure to, re to rank, to relevance rank, you know, the outputs of the catalog or responses to queries that human beings might make. You know, the recommendation ranking is critically important to help human beings assess the, you know, what's going on in the system and give them some advice about how to what avenues to explore, I think, so. Yeah, yeah, and that's part of our definition of data catalog. It's not just this inventory of technical metadata. Well, that would be boring and dry and useless. But that's for most where, human that's beings. That's where a lot of vendor solutions start, yeah. right? For people who and don't that's live an important foundation. Yeah, for people who don't live 100% of their work day inside the big data catalog, I, I hear what you're saying. You know? Yeah, so, so people who want a, a, a data catalog, how you make that relevant to the business, is you connect those technical assets, that technical metadata, with how is the business actually using this in practice, yeah. and how can we have proactive recommendations with recommendation engines and certifications, and this information steward then communicating through this platform to others in the organization about how do you interpret this data and how do you use it to actually make business decisions. And I think that's how we're going to close the gap between technology adoption and actual data-driven decision making, which mm. we're not quite seeing yet. We're only seeing about 30, when they survey, only about 36% of companies are actually confident they're making data-driven decisions, even though there have been you know, millions, if not billions of dollars that have gone into the data analytics market and investments. And it's because as a manager, I don't quite have the data literacy yet, mm. and I don't quite have the transparency across the rest of the organization to close that trust gap on analytics. Here's my feeling in, the, in terms of cultural transformations mm. across businesses in general. I think the legal staff of every company is going to need to get real savvy on using those kinds of tools like your catalog with recommendation engines to support e-discovery or discovery of the algorithmic decision paths that were taken by their companies products, because they're going to be called by judges and juries under subpoena and so forth and so on to explain all this. And they're human beings who've got law degrees but who don't know data. And they, they need the, the data environment to help them frame up a case for what we did and you know, so we, meaning the company in, 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 that's in, yeah, and involved. Yeah, and our you know? politicians. Lawyers. I mean, anyone who's, who's read Kathy's book, Weapons of Math Destruction, mm -hmm. there are some great use cases Math, of where- Math, M-A-T-H. Yes, yeah. M-A-T-H. But well, there's some great examples of where algorithms can go wrong, and many of our politicians and our representatives in government aren't quite ready to have that conversation. I think anyone who watched the Zuckerberg uh, hearings you know, in, in Congress saw the, the gap of knowledge that exists oh between gosh. the legal community and, you know, and the tech community today. So there's a lot of work to be done to get ready for this new future. But just getting back to the cultural transformation needed to, be, to make data-driven decisions, um, one of the things you were talking about is getting the, the managers to trust the data. And, and we're, we're hearing about what are the best practices to have that happen in the sense of starting small, um, be willing to experiment, get out of the lab, try to get to insight right away. What, are, what, what would your best advice be um, to gain trust in the data? Yeah, I think the biggest gap is this issue of transparency. How do you make sure that everyone understands each step of the process and has access to be able to dig into that? If you have a foundation of transparency, it's a lot easier to trust. Mm. Rather than, you know, right now we have kind of like the high priesthood of, of analytics going on, right? <laughs> <laughs> and some believers will believe, but a lot of folks won't. And, um, you know, the, the origin story of, of Alation is really about taking these concepts of, um, the scientific revolution and scientific process and how can we support for data analysis those same steps of scientific evaluation of a finding. Mm -hmm. That means that you need to publish your data set, you need to allow others to rework that data and come up with their own findings. Um, and you have to be open and, and foster conversations around data in your, your organization. 
Um, one other customer of ours, Meyer, who's a grocery store in the in the Midwest, and if you're West Coast or East Coast based, you might not have heard of them. But oh, Meyer's Thrifty Acres. I'm from Michigan. Gigantic. I know them. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Gigantic grocery chain in the Midwest, and um, Joe. Joe Oppenheimer there actually introduced a program that he calls the social contract for analytics. And before anyone gets their license to use Tableau or MicroStrategy or SaaS or any of the tools internally, he asks uh, those individuals to sign a social contract, which basically says that I'll make my work transparent, I will document what I'm doing so that it's shareable. I'll use certain standards and how I format the data so that if I come up with a, with a really insightful finding, mm -hmm it can be easily put into production throughout the rest of the organization. Mm -hmm. So this is a really simple example. His inspiration for that social contract was his high school freshman who was entering high school and had to sign a social contract that he wouldn't make fun of the teachers or the students. So, you <laughs> know, very simple you, basics. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. I wouldn't make fun we of the teachers. We all have social contract. Oh my gosh, you have to make fun of the teachers. I think it was a little more formal than that in the language, that, so that was the concept. That's violating yeah. your civil rights as a student, I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Stephanie, always so much fun to have you here. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> I'm Rebecca Knight for James Kobielus. We will have more of theCUBE's live coverage of DataWorks just after this.